Welcome to Up to the Minute. I'm Todd Duplantis. It is uh, Wednesday, October the 28th. We are moving through this week and I'm very happy to declare the fourth end of summer has surpassed us now. Welcome to the real fall. We had a couple of uh, false falls, but this is the real fall in Houston. Uh, it only lasts for about a week or so and then we move into the false winter version. So stick around for that. Brittany Pacheco is dressed for the season. Brittany, a little chilly this morning. Good morning, Todd. Yes, you know, uh, when you combine cold weather, which <clears throat> I don't mind, I, I, I appreciate the cold weather because obviously we live in Texas, it's hot. But when you combine that with the rain and the wind, it cuts to the bone and I'm not built for that. Like, no, I'm no, I, I don't know when this is ever okay. It's just not okay. So for you all who are from maybe the New England area or like Michigan and that kind of thing, kudos to you because I cannot deal. But I'm here to uh, <laughs> should be a friendly it's reminder. It's not 30 outside. It's 50, okay? It, it's, it's 50. It's rainy, Todd, okay? It's cold. <laughs> it's cold. Anyway, uh, moving on from the weather, I am here to remind you all to please take the opportunity to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell. And last but not least, please share this podcast that way we can grow our audience but more importantly we want to share all this information to those who are not following us so do your part hit that share button at the bottom so it pops up on your news feed and todd let's get into the show that's right in this show if you're just uh, tuning in right now we've got your hcc news and information for about the next half hour or so and we've got some special guests of course it's wednesday which means a visit with hcc police chief greg cunningham good morning chief Good morning, uh, Todd, Brittany, how you doing? Brittany, I'm one of those New Englanders, I'm sorry, but I moved here for a reason and it's not warm enough yet. I'm thinking Mexico next. <laughs> I don't I don't understand, why? Why do you wanna be in the heat? <laughs> well, because uh, I was in the cold long enough that I now appreciate the heat. <laughs> well, stick yeah, around, Chief, because I'm sure next week we'll reach the 70s and possibly 80s. That's the good thing about Houston weather. It'll change daily for you. So, Chief, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, we're going to be back with you in a moment, so please stand by. We're going to kick things off. We always like to highlight the programs at HCC's Coleman College. This morning is no exception. We've got Dr. Carla Tyson. Program Director for Health Information Services, HCC Coleman College for Health Sciences. Good morning, Dr. Tyson. Good morning, Todd Duplantis. It is good to see you with us. I know we visited before to talk about the program, but let's talk about the health information technology before we get to the meat of the program. I wanna ask you, how are things going with COVID? You've got students back in the buildings uh, completing, I imagine, uh, their lab work. And how have things been going really over the last eight months? Well, actually they've been pretty good. Our program is not on campus, but there are several programs that are on campus. Programs that have to do hands-on training, such as um, medical assisting, dental, they have to train their students with their hands. So they are on campus, everything's going wonderful, everything's fantastic. Uh, administration's doing a great job. Um, our college operations has done a fantastic job with, with getting the students in and out safely, as well as the faculty. Our program is online, so our students are not on campus and they are keeping up with their coursework perfectly. They were able to finish the spring semester. We were able to graduate our students during the summer. So your students are, are uh, they're able to take this program fully online with or without COVID. Um, you were established for that. Tell us a bit about um, the health information. I imagine this is something we know as medical records. That's correct. Uh, we used to be called medical record librarians long time ago. When I went to school, I got a degree in medical record administration. Now it's called health information and health information systems, health information management, health information technology, all the same. But what we do is we manage the information that healthcare providers generate, such as when you've been to a hospital, you may have been admitted, you may have seen a physician lately, immediately from the receptionist to the nurse to the physician medical information is being generated on you so that the so that the clinicians can have a continuity of care so they can know what has going on with you from beginning to end and that way you can get quality treatment 
Let me ask you this. Um, since COVID has hit, are workers in this field available? Is it able, are they able to work remotely or are they still needed on the hospital sites or on the doctor sites? Yes, they are working remotely and some health information people are actually at the facility. It all depends on the policy of that uh, healthcare hospital or our, our clinic, but yes, they are still working. Work still needs to be managed. Patients still need patient care. And if patients are being treated, health information is being generated. Health information is being maintained, is being analyzed, is everything is still produced through health information. Let me say this, health information is the heartbeat of the healthcare institution. If there's no information flowing from here to there, healthcare can't continue. Um, what type of environments can your graduates expect to work in? You mentioned the hospital environment. Can they work for uh, general practice doctors, individual doctors, clinics? Can they work for insurance companies? How does that work? Yes, they work for hospitals. Uh, a lot of them work for clinics like Kelsey Siebel. They work for insurance companies. They work for um, the health department, Texas Department of uh, Health and Human Services. They work for any place health information is generated. That's where we are. Who? World Health Organization. CDC has been in the news a lot lately. Yeah. Where do they get this information from? They get it from health information practitioners. So they have health information practitioners who work for CDC. Somebody is crunching these numbers and analyzing this health information. And it's people who look like us. Do you have various uh, types of degrees um, all the way up to an associate's degree? Can you get a short-term certification, a long-term certification, two-year degree? Can you transfer into uh, a four-year program? How does that work? Yes, Todd, and I love these questions you ask. Yes, we have a nine-month analyst certificate, and we have a one-year coding certificate, and they feed into our associate degree. So you can start with your analyst certificate, pick up your coding certificate, and then get your associate's degree. It's like three in one, not a bad thing. And yeah. you can also get your baccalaureate degree in health information, your master's degree in health informatics, and a doctorate degree in health informatics. And are, while you're getting these degrees and getting your certifications, is there, a jo is there a job market for undergraduates who are going through this program? Yes, which is why we have that three tiers. We noticed that a lot of our students would come to our program and they wanted a job. So what we did was we inserted the analyst certificate and the coding certificate. So as they progress toward their associate degree, they could get an entry level position. And that is exactly what they're able to do with the analyst certificate and the coding certificate. They're able to get entry level jobs as they work toward their associate degrees. And a lot of students may wonder, well, gee, I don't know if I have the funds for this. Is Are scholarships available? And uh, obviously, can you get financial aid to help pay for these programs in order to get out into the job market as quickly as possible? Yes, financial aid is available for our students. And we also are very fortunate. We have a scholarship specifically for health information students at Houston Community College. They would apply for the Mr. Jones Bell Bonds Scholarship in order to use that money toward paying for their classes. Um, a lot of students may wonder, well, we're, we're in a lockdown right now. People just aren't hiring. But is that the case? Uh, can students fully take their courses remotely and find a job remotely as well? When uh, should, you know, should we go into another lockdown situation? You know, it is difficult. You know, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it's difficult. It's difficult not being on campus. It's difficult not seeing your faculty or your professor face to face. It's difficult. However, everything is set up so that you can online, apply to the program, register for the program, take your classes online. Additionally, people are still hiring. Again, it's difficult. They're not hiring as many people, but no. there are jobs out there. You just have to be diligent and put forth a, um, 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 a, a good front. You have to show people that you're the reason they should hire you as opposed to your competitor. Let me ask you this, what type of graduate, what attracts people to this program or what type of people would enjoy a field in health information technology? People who like um, 
uh, computers, if you like doing things digitally, uh, even if you like paperwork, you like to do calculations, you like analyzing uh, information, you like data crunching, you like uh, doing data analytics, you love statistics. I love statistics. It's my favorite class. But people who love um, digitizing information, uh, observing information, and people who like to be detectives, who like going through information and finding out why is this patient sick? Why did this patient come to the hospital in the first place? Let's see why they're here. Because the ultimate goal of health information is to help the clinicians diagnose and treat the patient and get the patient well. That's our job. We're like, I call our, I tell our students, we're like the Keegler elves. You never know who bakes those really good cookies until they're gone. And then you start looking for the, who made these cookies? Why are the cookies not here? That's who we are. We're Keebler elves. People don't know who we are until the information is not there. Then they come looking for, why right. can't I treat this patient? I need more information to treat this patient. And that's our job. Health information technology, a growing program and a growing field, very needed right now. Um, if you'd like more information, we're gonna include the link to uh, Dr. Carla Tyson's program in the social media post for the show. Dr. Tyson, thanks for being here Thank today. You. Thank you so much. All right, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. All right, moving on to the Chief. It's good to have you here with us on a Wednesday, Chief Cunningham, as always, every Wednesday morning. Chief, we need to get a sponsor for your segment. So let's let's work on that because we should say Chief's here presented by Snap-on Tools or something like that. I'll start working on that. There's yeah. uh, there's actually a couple of folks out there that, that may be interested in doing that for you. You know, we'll get that, we'll, we'll get that and we'll take the money and we'll use it for student scholarships. So let's see if we can work on that. All right. Um, I wanna ask you about something that's going on right now, Chief. Of course, it's in the news because early voting's taking place in Houston across the nation. I know in Harris County, the county been phenomenal. I think uh, more than 1.3 million uh, Houstonians have voted early and we have a number of sites open on our campuses. We, we absolutely do, Todd. And, and um, you know, we've been doing it now for about a week. I want to tell you we're closing in on maybe eight, nine days of it. Um, and we will continue to do early voting, I believe, through Friday is the last day. Um, we have several sites. Um, they're listed on our website and um, um, and we can get to them, but they're the large sites around the city. Uh, they've been just flowing perfectly. In fact, I went to one and voted um, and I don't think I was there for 15 minutes and it was done. The lines are very manageable. These guys are organized like you wouldn't believe. Um, and uh, uh, they're voting where you can go into a booth and vote or they've got drive-through voting at several little locations, which is really unique. I tried that this time and it was a lot of fun. Um, so, so we are ready and it is working really, really well. And Chief, another thing that I wanna to talk to you about, because I know at the West Loop campus, for example, when I used to work there, there they'd always have a, a Halloween celebration for the community, that was several years ago. And I know um, we, we can't really have big celebrations right now, but we've got something going on at the Southeast College though. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the community uh, uh, members in the, uh, around the Southeast College have reached out to our president down there. And what we've set up is basically a twofold program, right? You've seen some of the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the food distributions and those kind of things. Well, they've set up a Halloween situation that's going to be very, very similar to that. There's going to be limited numbers because, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, they can't service the, uh, uh, the entire city. But um, they're going to be bringing folks through. They're going to do it just like some of our drive-through uh, drop-offs have been, where people queue up, they're in their cars, um, put on your costumes and come on through. Um, and the local community uh, uh, folks are going to have some gifts for you and uh, a little bit of candy for those kids. And certainly fun for all. It's a, it sounds like a safe way to uh, celebrate uh, Halloween uh, with the family out there at the Southeast College. Chief, I wanna move on to a more serious subject. And unfortunately, over the past few months, this has been reoccurring uh, with conversations that we've had, but most recently a shooting of uh, a man in, in, in Philadelphia uh, by police officers. It was a fatal shooting and it's caused some civil unrest in Philadelphia. And I know you and I have touched on this before uh, about conversations really that need to happen between the community and the police force. 
Yeah, so Todd, you're 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 spot on. Um, this situation is brand new, and it's still being uh, uh, still being investigated and rolled out. A lot of it was played out in video, and the community is disturbed. And of course, we've got violence, we've got unrest, and we've got looting. Um, what we need to say on the front end of this is that is the wrong answer. Okay, um, that no matter how tragic the situation was, whether police officers were right or wrong, we'll all come out in the wash. Um, but making a community pay that price through violence and, and looting is, is the wrong answer. You and I have talked early, early on, Todd, that, that there needs to be a hard conversation between the community, their needs and wants, and law enforcement, and how we're going to meet those needs, what needs we can fill, uh, fulfill, and how we're going to fulfill those needs. Um, those conversations, I'm not hearing them happen as much as I would have expected and liked to have had. Um, Houston is blessed. We are a very reasonable community and we have a very good relationship with our law enforcement. Uh, the governor is here today for a back the blue uh, uh, program down at the uh, Police Officers Association. So our community is really very, very supportive of law enforcement in general. Um, we need to have these conversations to make sure that our community and our police department are bonded together on service needs. Well, one thing that I know our community has done, I know uh, Mayor Turner has established a task force of individuals to work with uh, the police community, including um, Chief uh, Police Chief Art Acevedo. And uh, that seems to at least be taking place and that seems to be sparking some conversation locally. Do you think that uh, is one, obviously one good step locally that's happening, but we need to ha see this happen on more of a broader scale again around the nation? Yeah, that you're, I think you're spot on, Todd. Uh, number one is, is Art is a friend and he has managed this thing about as well as you can. Um, you know, across the board right from the beginning of it. And I think that the mayor and Art, along with all of the other law enforcement professionals in the area, have been driving this thing forward. And really, we have done a pretty good job. And Houston has been very open and has welcomed those conversations. Uh, but I think, I, I think around the nation, we aren't doing so well. Um, Philadelphia is just the latest uh, uh, um, situation that, that, that demonstrates that those, those conversations aren't happening at the level that they need to and, and, and progress isn't being made as quickly as it needs to be made. Chief, I want to ask you, go back to COVID, about some mask mandates um, that are going on around. Of course, things have been changing in this country as some of the cases have been rising. But around the world, you've got some uh, interesting facts because um, the around the world's acting, act, actually uh, reacting a little bit differently than we are here in the States. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, bear in mind, uh, the rest of the world had a head start on us when this thing started, right? There were problems in Italy and there were problems in Europe long before the United States really started to see uh, um, it, COVID spiking. So when you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, I encourage you to take a look at, the, at, at those folks today, right? Because that's exactly what I've done. Um, Italy, who was hit horribly the first time around, is now starting to have that problem again. Right. Um, they're mandating masks. They're beginning to do lockdowns. Um, and quite honestly, the, the communities after eight, nine months have pretty low tolerance for being locked down again. Yeah. And it's causing conflict. Right. Um, Russia has done a mask mandate nationally. So, again, I, I think the message for folks in the U.S. is, number one, we've done a really good job of controlling this thing this summer. We know how to do this. But we have to do it because if we don't do it, government's going to start to mandate that we do yeah. it. And we're going to end up back in these hard lockdowns and having to go out for nothing but groceries. And nobody wants to be there again. Yeah, I remember when uh, this was just starting and we were looking at uh, video from Italy back in like February, um, thinking, boy, I'm glad that's not us. How can they just lock down the nation? Next thing you know, we're under, we were under the same lockdown. Um, Chief, I want to move on to a bit of a more lighter note, uh, and I'm going to bring Brittany into this conversation because you've got an uh, interesting fact about Borat, the movie. So everybody, uh, um, everybody saw the first Borat movie, I think. It was really hard not to see it. You didn't see it, Brittany? Oh, my goodness. So, um, so just real not? quick, Chief and Todd, 
I was in high school when that movie came out and I was <laughs> oh, not boy. allowed to watch it because of the content. Um, my parents were very overprotective, but anyway, um, I know it's available now, so I do need to check up on it. So I probably won't get the joke, but proceed. <laughs> Okay, so the high school comment was just mean and unnecessary just for the record. That really okay. made me feel old, too. Boy. Yeah, wow. yeah that's why you were laughing. <laughs> oh. But anyway, so uh, Borat has now come out with a new movie. And the interesting part about it is uh, some of the countries that were targeted by him in the first movie, really, I, they banned the movie. They wouldn't let anybody in the country see it. And it turns out now that um, he, he seems to have become part of the marketing campaign for some of those places. And uh, I don't know if you guys have it. Do you have the links so that we can show what we've yeah. got? Yeah, we do have a link here. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen. Uh, okay, Nathan is Nathan's uh, showing this. Our director's showing it right now as we're talking. But yeah, yeah, there's a, so the, so it boils down to, I guess, Chief, is the, the catchphrase for the new tourism ad for Kazakhstan is very nice. <laughs> that was, uh, oh, and I'm I sorry, guess. Was I supposed to answer that? Yes, it's, yeah. it, it's very nice. <laughs> And that was uh, that was the catchphrase from Borat. You know, Brittany can go back and catch up on the movie after making us all feel ancient. Thanks a lot, Brittany. I, I don't know about you, Chief, but it just seems like to me like the first Borat movie doesn't seem that long ago. Yeah, I'm thinking it was just like a year or two, wasn't it? <laughs> wow. Wow. Brittany was in high school and not allowed to watch it. Yeah. Like I said, uh, my parents were very overprotective and um everyone was watching it and i was just that odd man out who just kind of had to smile and nod and be like okay <laughs> yeah there you go i remember the first movie my parents uh pg movie my parents let me watch and this is really going to make you feel old Re remember logan's run <laughs> yeah. yeah that was the first one i was allowed to watch all my friends were going to see pg movies and i get to go see logan's run which wasn't that bad back in what 77. So anyway, that dates us all. Chief, we want to thank you for being here on Wednesdays. As always, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Guys, it was great to see you. Thanks for having me, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, sounds good. All right, Brittany, on to our HCC News and Information. Uh, student life, boy, they're celebrating right now. Tis the season for student life to celebrate Halloween. Yes, I'm so excited for this uh, because they've got some unique, uh, I want to say this this one event right here is very unique, virtual palm readers, Todd. So what do you do? Do you hold up your, your palm like this? You know what? I guess you just have to sign up and, and participate to find out how all this works. So it's going to feature this ancient divination tradition to analyze the symbols and lines on your hands. Of course, mine's covered up right now. Yeah. Um, and it gives the chance to have your palms read virtually. Now, this is happening tonight at 6 p.m. Um, very interesting, you know, event for sure. And then they're also going to have a Halloween costume contest, Todd. So you're at home wearing a costume contest. You go virtual with it and they vote on it. Is that how that works? Uh, apparently so. So you can cast your vote for the best Halloween costume. Prizes given to first, second, and third place winner. So you can cast your, your vote all the way through tomorrow, October 9th. And then Another drive-in, Todd. That's so right. Excited. The other one was a big hit, so we're having another one, Monsters, Inc. I imagine you probably saw this when it came out, right? Uh, no, not immediately. I'm pretty sure I saw it like later, but uh, it, it's one of my favorite movies for it's sure. Movie. Um, so drive-in is happening at the Stafford campus uh, tomorrow, actually, Thursday, uh, October 29th at 7 p.m., they're going to host an out of this world movie under the stars featuring Monsters, Inc. So there's going to be complimentary popcorn, drinks, candy, and it's on a first come first serve basis. So only students with vehicles will be allowed at this event. So that's crucial. Um, check your emails uh, to register for these events. You're going to probably want to search from Student Life. And keeping on with our Halloween theme, Rex Sports is having, uh, they're not just for fitness. They have a lot of fitness, all types of stuff. 
but they're also having a decor a pumpkin decorating contest uh deadline to register is friday october the 30th and you need to send them a picture of your creation of course i told you about my creation last week uh, the, the one I participated in back in college, which was award winning, thank you. But you can submit your photos to roy.byers at hccs.edu. We'll have his email address in the uh, social media post for the show. And there's a virtual walkathon happening as well, Brittany. Yeah, that's happening next week, uh, beginning November 1st through the 7th. So students will submit their miles every day by 8 p.m. And prizes for top five males and females with first place and winners will receive a Fitbit. That's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool yeah. prize to to yep. get. Um, the deadline to register, however, is this Saturday, October 31st. Again, this is happening next week from November 1st through the 7th. Just be sure to apply by uh, October 31st. Submit your miles to lewis.earl at hcs.edu. And for more info on Rex Sports events, you can go to their website at hcs.edu slash Rex Sports. That's right. And uh, virtual ideas pitch competition uh, that is happening as well. You can uh, have, uh, let's see, HCC's entrepreneurial initiatives in Impact Hub Houston. That's a long title, but uh, the deadline to join them is November 13th. The finalist presentation is November 20th. They're having prizes, Brittany, of $1,000, $750 and $250. And there's a website you can visit for all the information, uh, hccs.com edu slash pitch if you haven't attended one of these pitch competitions they're pretty cool they're like the shark tank but they're very cool and uh, students really have some great ideas Brittany um, there's some ideas on companies where they sometimes they've already launched these companies and they use the money to seed the company and, and help it grow yeah no I know I think I saw something recently I can't remember if it was local or not but a high schooler uh, was was really taking this whole COVID situation and trying to figure out a way to, you know, find a vaccine or how to cure it. And and I tell you, these young minds here are definitely the way to our future because yeah. they are just incredible individuals. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing what our high school and other college students have to uh, have to showcase for this pitch idea, uh, ideas pitch competition rather. And another thing that's happening, the Project Homeworld, that's ongoing. They have uh, something happening on Thursday, October 29th, which is tomorrow. 3D printing for good, uh, that's happening. And also data for good, Tuesday, November 3rd, 2 to 3 p.m. For more information, you can visit hccs.edu slash homeworld. And the Brittany, I can't believe we're already coming up to November. That's going to happen on Sunday. And we're getting to the end, close to the end of our all in for HCC campaign. Yeah, we're closing in on the opportunity for faculty and staff members to help our students uh, with a payroll deduction for the all in for HCC campaign. Now, this is good uh, for a year. Um, and as a former scholarship recipient from the HCC Foundation, I can't tell you enough how much one, it means to us students, and then two, it makes all the difference in the world. So uh, be sure to enroll for this plan to make an impact all year long. That's the payroll deduction. This ends next Friday, November 6th. So donate by going to hccs.edu slash all in for HCC. And don't forget to share it on social media with using the same hashtag all in for HCC. We are about out of time, Brittany. Um, let's see, tomorrow we've got Dr. Erica Stevens who'll join us to discuss the upcoming virtual Betacheck Orman auction, which is happening online. HCC TV is helping out with that. And also the season's upon us. Uh, we've got Thursday virtual family fun guests talking about Dia de los Muertos, Brittany. Also known as Day of the Dead, thanks to the Houston Museum of Natural Science. I'm so excited. Yay. That'll be a lot of fun. And you know, on Friday, I've got a friend of mine who's going to join us on the show. We did a pilot years ago um, on a paranormal TV show that we tried to sell the networks, but he's an actual ghost hunter. He was in a, uh, uh, he had a company years ago that would be brought out to find ghosts. So he'll be joining us on Friday for a Halloween theme show. So a real ghost hunter joining us. That doesn't sound suspenseful at all. <laughs> no, that's actually really cool. Um, uh, we can talk more about that to, on Friday because I've yep. had a couple of experiences, I feel, with 
um, ghosts. So I oh, think- you definitely going to be talking to him then. We'll bring. Oh him yeah, in. definitely in New Orleans of all places yeah. too. So. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So I uh, just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us this morning on Up to the Minute. Don't forget about our social media pages and YouTube. And don't forget to share this podcast. That's right. Join us tomorrow. See if Brittany's going to wear a parka if it gets colder. And uh, we'll be here live at 10 a.m. with all your HCC news and information right here on Up to the Minute.